And I want to thank you who spent a few minutes with me. It is indeed my honor and my privilege to uh, spend that time with you, and I thank you for that. Uh, you know, we were talking about step six, and I didn't get quite finished, and I, I really didn't realize that the, the sessions got shorter. To give you an idea, I usually do one hour on each step. So to do three in like 40 minutes is uh, tough, but we'll get her done. Um, and and uh, step six in, in uh, the shortcomings and the defects of character, uh, I didn't get a chance to touch on a lust. <laughs> you know, isn't it funny? Lust is one of those things that we say, oh, don't take it quite all away. Just leave me a little. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> kind of flies in the face of the step. Uh, But what I've got to work for, and I don't know what you have to work for, but what I have to work for is to get as close to clean as I can be. As close to clean as I can be. So I ask God, uh, in the seventh step prayer, uh, which we closed the last meeting with, that prayer, my Creator, I'm now willing that you should have all of me. I love that prayer. But I also got to tell you, I remember the night that I laid in bed and I said, God, if there's anything standing between you and me, take it. And I meant it with every fiber of my being, and I met the next line equally, even if I like it. Take it. Because all I want to do, I want to be close as, I want God to be as close as my own breath. That's what I want. That's what I want out of life. And, you know, since I've done that and meant it with that depth of sincerity, my life has changed dramatically. When we talk about Step 7, it talks over and over about humility. You don't hear that talked about much in meetings anymore at all. It used to be a common topic. can't tell you the last time I heard it as a topic. Why? Because there's very little of it anymore. It's all about us and our programs and our boundaries and our our recovery and it's my recovery and it's all about me and I come first and I'm not uh, my home group. It's supposed to be about humility. I don't mean humiliation. We've had enough of that. It's about humility. And what does humility mean to you? And how are you practicing humility in your life? Let's get really personal. What are you doing to be a humble human being? I pick up messes that aren't mine. I make extra sure I'm nice to the people who've been very mean to me. I remember that of myself I am absolutely nothing. Without you, without my God, I would have been gone a long time ago. That isn't a mystery. And I don't ever want to lose that fact. Now, humility flies in the face of all modern psychology. It flies in the face of all of it. That's why it's a problem. That's why psychiatry and psychology has failed miserably in helping people of my type. Because it asks us to go back and undo the very work we've done. Humility. How do you find humility? Well, you find it by looking in your heart, oddly enough. And if you did a four, five, good four, five, six, seven, and eight, uh, you're going to find that it's a preferred way to be, at least that's been my experience. I find it very difficult to be around loud and aggressive people because I was a loud and aggressive person for a long time, sober. And for me to be humble, I need to be around light, like energy. So those are my friends. Those are the people I talk to and I associate with. Oh, I have fun and I'm around people that are loud and noisy and all that, but uh, I don't stay around them long simply because I can be affected by my outer surroundings. It's a statement of humility for me to tell that to you. I always like the statement to say, well, the minute you think you got humility, you don't have it. Well, there's that's cute. 
How's that going to work for you? What that's saying to the alcoholic of my type, it is, is never attainable. Ever, never attainable. That's not correct. It's totally attainable. And the 12 steps are the exact directions on how to do that. I... Uh, there's too many things floating around in my head right now. To supplement God's will for my will. To ask God to remove all these defects of character, it's going to take something I'm not familiar with or wasn't familiar with, and it's called discipline. Mental, physical, and spiritual discipline. Now, if you go into that room and you tell God you're hungry and you pray for a hot dog, there is a chance that a hot dog will magically appear. But probably won't. But if you go in that room and you say, God, I need a hot dog, and then you go out expecting to find a hot dog, I'll bet you find a hot dog. Because that's the way I understand it to work. Everything I have sent out into other people's lives has come back into my own. Selfishness, self-centeredness, that is the root of our problem. I put that stuff out, it comes right back, eventually. It's a full circle. Uh, if you keep doing what you're doing, you're going to keep getting what you're getting. I love that saying. If your life is misery and that's what you're putting out, that's what you're going to get back. I had to look at the ways I viewed about every area of my life. I talked briefly with a couple people about grief, and I want to spend a minute on that because it's, it's very powerful. A number of people drink after they lose somebody when they get sober. And uh, everybody says, gee, well, why was that? And, and the question, the answer is probably a little too simple and too practical, but it's just because they usually don't have practice dealing with that sober. We got practice dealing with all the other events in our life. But when somebody dies, but this whole thing about grief, uh, they've made grief into a business today. I hear people on TV all the time saying, you know, I'm going to be grieving the rest of my life. And you know what? They're going to be grieving the rest of their life because they've got their mind set on it. About three years ago, I had a guy come into my office, four years ago maybe now, and he came in and it was on a Monday, and he said, you know, Ed, I'm really going to be depressed Friday. And I thought, well, at least you're planning them. That's good, I guess. You know, <laughs> progress. I, uh... And I said, why are you going to be depressed? And he said, it's the anniversary of my daughter's death. And I said, oh. And it had been a few years since she passed. And I said a little prayer, and then I said, well, I'll tell you what. Thursday night when you go to bed, do you have a favorite picture of her? He said, oh, yes. I said, put that right by your bed. Friday morning, the minute you wake up, you start celebrating every curl on her head, every giggle, every kiss on the cheek, every tickle, every good moment you had, and you spend your whole day lifting her memory. Or you can make it all about you. You know what he did. He made a request of me that's physically impossible and left. <laughs> and I understand why he left. He had a good two weeks of meetings going, What's wrong, Ed? Oh, it's the anniversary of my daughter's death. Oh, oh. When I saw that I did that in my life, it made me sick. I used the death to get attention. Had no idea. Oh, Ed, he's the son of a murder victim. What happened? His father was murdered. Oh, yeah, yeah. Made me sick when I realized that. There's a great story. It's a story. It's a, it's, I, I watched it happen. It was on TV. And uh, there was this guy came, and he'd been grieving his son's death for four years. And I mean, he was in pain. He would sob every day. And I don't know if you've ever had your heart broken like that sober, but I have, where you sobbed every day. And uh, that's where he was with this grief. And it was just such a heavy burden on his heart and his mind. He was a good guy, you could tell. And he wasn't trying to be self-pitying. He, he was just caught in this grief, and he couldn't get out of it. 
And this guy uh, who was helping him said, hey, uh, would you would you do a little uh, visioning with me like we did this morning at meditation? If you weren't there, you really missed a nice one. But uh, he said, I'm going to... Uh, uh, he said, what faith are you? And he said, Christian. And he said, okay. He said, I want you to close your eyes and vision this with me. He said, okay. And the guy closed his eyes. He said, I want you to see the gates of the pearly gates. They're there and they're just beautiful. And they're and St. Peter's out front. Do you see it? And he said, yeah. He said, yeah, I see that. He said, do you see that line of people? Uh, there's a big line of people right in front of him. And they all have wonderful white robes on. And he said, okay, yeah, I can see that. And he said, they come up to St. Peter and they hold out their candle and light their candle off of St. Peter's candle. And when it comes back, their entire face and their gowns illuminate. And they're happy and they're joyous and they're free and they go into heaven. He said, can you see that? And he said, yeah, it's amazing. He said, now I want you to look over to the left. And I want you to see your son sitting on a bench all by himself with the candle and he said I want you to ask your son why you're there and I'll answer for your son and he said okay and he said ask him he said son why are you sitting there and he said dad every time I light my candle your tears drowned it out let me go in let me go in it's all the way we look at things you know grief is tough losing's tough since I've been sober, my father was murdered, two brothers been killed by drunk drivers, brother-in-law committed suicide, sister-in-law committed suicide, another brother-in-law put a gun to his head, he was a vegetable for two years, lost tons of dear friends sober. I know lost, but if there's one thing else I know. Today I'm celebrating their memory rather than making it all about my pain. Because I choose to. Because I change my mind because anything else would be a lack of humility. Anything else would be a lack of humility. And when we pray that seventh step prayer, be as honest as you can about it. I love the way Bill kind of dances around it because Bill had a few things he was working on and uh, (laughs) wasn't quite ready to give up the ship yet. Uh, But he was also, what, eight years sober, ten years sober when he wrote this book? Now, if you're new, that sounds like a lot. If you're on the other side of that, you're thinking, God, you know, when I ask somebody ten years sober to get me a cup of coffee, I wonder if they'll ever make it back, you know. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, Fred, haven't seen you in ages, you know. Back this way, you know. (laughs) It's true. So, uh... I really, I really ask God to remove all those shortcomings. And what do I mean by a shortcoming? I mean anything that short circuits our relationship. You know, even to the point of you just not being able to stand me, I'll give you plenty of room. I'm in the gym. I was working out for about a year. And I, I realized I don't need to curl 160 pounds and my chest doesn't need to be 58 inches. I didn't mean for that to happen. It just happened. But I'm going by the gym, and the guy that owns the gym has been a member of AA for 18 years, does not like me at all. Trashes me every time he gets a chance. That's his deal. It ain't mine. He's got a nice gym. I signed up. I go to the gym. I'm walking by his office one day, and God says, (laughs) ask him to lunch. And I said, excuse me? (laughs) He said, ask him to lunch. I said, I don't think so. And he said, Ed, go in there and ask Pete if he's got time for lunch. Okay. Opened the door and Pete was there and he said, uh, I said, hey Pete, you got time for lunch? And he looked at me and he was a little startled and he said, really, do you have a minute? And I said, yeah. He said, oh, I'd love to go to lunch. We went to lunch and about halfway through lunch he was sobbing because he was ready to blow his brains out. He had gotten his God mixed up with what he possessed. And we laugh now because we figured out he was down to his last 150,000. <laughs> you know, but, but, well, you know, that's a lot of money when you think that's all there is. <laughs> but I was so pleased that I was able to follow direction and discipline myself to do what I'm asked regardless of what I thought. And Pete and I are dear friends today. 
And he's one of my biggest defenders. Isn't that funny? But I'm also thank God that I didn't have to approach Pete and say, you know, I hear you've been saying some things about me. Say anything you want. If it's true, if it's true, if it's not, it's not. One of the things I learned in Alcoholics Anonymous, if I'm not doing anything wrong, there's nothing to defend. You're allowed to say whatever you want to say about me at any given time. Me, my God, and my sponsor knows exactly what I'm up to. And I have nothing to defend today. What a great freedom. What a great freedom. You know, in making that list of all persons we had harmed and become willing to make amends to them all. Oh, wanted to talk about fear for a minute. Back that truck up. I want to talk about fear for a minute because fear would paralyze me. It run my life. I realized after some inventories that fear was the instigator in everything in my life. That I, I, lo- I lived a life of fear, even though you probably couldn't tell it from the outside. But everything... I was afraid of and the ones that bothered me most were the nameless fears that weren't attached to anything and I found out for me the answer to my fear is faith now that seems maybe obvious to you but I didn't know that I'd pray for God to remove the faith instead of have the faith that God had removed the fear you know what I mean for God to remove the fear and I'd get that all crossways Faith is walking through a situation that you're afraid of. You know, it's like courage, especially with the war going on and all that kind of stuff. You hear certain things, and I get the idea sometimes people think courage is, well, my friend's in trouble out there, and now there's five machine guns, but I'm going to go save my buddy. No. Courage to me is, oh my God, Fred's hit. And I am terrified, but I got to do what I can. And he goes anyway. It's the same thing with faith. Yeah, you're going to be nervous sometimes. You're going to be afraid. But walk forward anyway. Discipline yourself to move forward anyway. Because the moment you do, it'll take away the power fear has. And sometimes it takes longer than others, but I promise you, if you continue to walk in faith through that fear, my first act of faith was I was a light sleeper. (laughs) I slept with the light on. And um, (laughs) I'd be thrown in jail. I'd beat up the guy next to the light in the cell. You know, I'm sleeping with the light on. And uh, my first act of faith, I remember, I walked over in that room and I I went to turn off that light and I thought, man, if I die before I wake up, I'll never talk to you again. (laughs) And I turned off that light and I went and I laid down and I slept like a baby. And I've never had to sleep with a light on since. But I had to walk through the fear. Faith isn't always an absence of fear. Faith is walking through it in spite of the fear. In spite of the fear. Discipline mental, physical, and spiritual. Those books, these steps aren't going to do a thing if you leave them on these pages. Anything in this book and this program means absolutely nothing except maybe a good conversation for somebody else that doesn't know. The big difference is is when I discipline myself to take what I found in these pages and bring out in my life and to change my actions and my attitudes. That's the difference I find. I walk in, in, into a community today that I am just loved and respected. And it just touches my heart. There are restaurants I go into and people just come up and literally hug me from every nationality you can and I hug them right back because I absolutely love them. You know, since I decided I could love everybody, I don't have to hate anybody anymore. Now that may sound minor to you, but that's major to me. That's major to me. And the best proof of how I can do that is how you've treated me since I came to Alcoholics Anonymous. Everybody treated me with love. When I was newly sober, they poured coffee at the meeting I was in, and and I was a shaker, man. Any other shakers here? I I shook bad. (laughs) 
How you doing, Ed? Oh, fine. Yeah, good to see you. Cup of coffee? No, thanks. Cup of chips, my teeth. Jeez. Yeah, you know, and I was just, you know, piece of cake? No, can't have sharp objects. And my arms just kind of, you know. And I was wired for sound, and I had two rules. Don't come up behind me and don't touch me. Real simple rules. And little Harry Stevens was the coffee pourer in the group I went to. And he'd come around and pour coffee, and he'd come up behind me, and he'd put his hand right here. And a peace would come over me, like, like I never knew. I didn't get it, but God, I loved it. And he'd pour my coffee, and the madness would stop. And the voices would stop, and the gut would stop, and I could breathe. And I swore Harry pour the coffee slow, you know. And then he'd go, and as soon as he'd left, it'd start again. You know, and I'd drink that coffee just as quick as I could. So Harry'd come back, put his hand on this big old tough street punk, and let him know it's okay, that it's okay. That's the kind of love I was exposed to in AA. And that's the kind I hope makes a comeback. It's still here, but it's been replaced with something we call sarcasm. Some people call it a sense of humor. I call it a smart mouth. And I was excellent at it. I could cut you off with one word. Just make you. And I, I used to think, well, you just don't like anybody who's quicker than you are. You just don't have as quick a mind as I have. One day my sponsor pulled me aside and said, Ed, I want to talk to you. And I said, why? He said, the very people that love you the most can't stand to be with you anymore because you're your mouth. And I said, God, show me the effects my humor has on other people. And I went to a meeting and uh, there was this little girl came up to me. I don't remember her name. I remember her eyes very clearly. And she was come up and was happy and bubbly and just... And she came up and was probably saying something very positive to me. And I turned around and made some snide remark and a joke at her expense. By the way, humor is when everybody's laughing. But, but, but I made a, a joke at her expense and I laughed and I walked away and I got about halfway down the aisle. And her eyes came back into my mind's eye. And I had just crushed her. I had just broken her heart. And I cried like a baby. It's not my job to be cute and clever in one-upsmanship in Alcoholics Anonymous. I gave it up that day. Well, several other people have taken it up, but I don't participate in it anymore. If you go to the word sarcasm and you go to its Greek root, it means ripping and tearing of flesh. Did you know that? Absolutely true. That certainly has to do with step six and seven for me my vicious sense of what I called humor, what it was, was gossip, barbed anger, and character assassination. That's what it was. And I don't ever want to do that again. And I still get lessons. You know, I was down south the other day, uh, about a month ago, and uh, there was a guy, he was laying across the the benches there before the meeting, and me and another big-time speaker were walking up. He was laying there, and I grabbed his big toe, and I jokingly said, You're healed. And they laughed, and I laughed. And somebody else spoke that time, and then come up. And this guy came up to me after me and said, Can I talk to you for a minute? And I said, Sure. He said, I just want to tell you that I'm dying. I've got hepatitis C, and I'm too old for a transplant. And I'm laying there trying to get up enough energy to see if I can sit through that meeting. And you come through with your cute little remark. And I said, thank you so much for telling me. And I am so, so sorry. I know better. I know better. And I did it anyway. I did it anyway. Had a little friend last night at dinner. Said he had to go to the restroom. I said, I think about a waterfall. Ha ha. And of course I got up and he went to the restroom and he came back and he said, I got very weak kidneys. Another lesson. I am so sorry. Another lesson. 
you know, we got our choice what we're going to be in this world, especially now that we're sober and we got these steps. For the first time in my life, I had a choice. You gave it to me. You can be the best you can be or be the same person you've always been with a big L on your forehead. It's up to you. And I really, really want to be the best person I can be. Eighth step. Made a list of all persons we had harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. Notice there's a little word in there twice. (laughs) All. I have a guy I sponsor. He's so cute. He, uh, He came up to me and said, well, I'll put my name on the top of the list. And I said, and you'll find a new sponsor. He said, why? I said, your name was on the top of the list. That's why you got a list. (laughs) That's the problem. You always came first. Even when you were enabling, it was for your own well-being. It wasn't for them. Take your name right off that list. Because if you do what these steps ask you to do, guess what? You'll have an amend to yourself beyond all amends. You'll be able to live happy, joyous, and free. But I remember writing down that list and going over to my sponsor's house, and I was really depressed. I walked in and I said, man, this list just it saddens me. It just makes... He said, yeah, Ed, all this time you thought that you were misunderstood, huh? <laughs> they knew exactly who they were dealing with. And I had amends to make that I may or may not have been on your list, but they were certainly on mine. And that's a continuing list, by the way. 35 years later, I can still add to the list from 35 years ago. But what I did is to make that commitment to do all in all. I made a list of all persons we had harmed, became willing to make amends to them all. In that list, I'm glad I went over it with my sponsor. Because in my judgment, not many of them deserved an amend even though I felt so bad when I showed him the list. But after I was done with the list, I realized, yeah, everyone he pointed out, and we talked about each and every one, and I'm grateful for it. Because there were some amends I wanted to make back for maybe financial gain later. My sponsor knew me, and I'm real grateful. And we went through that list, and then he said, okay, you got to go make them. He said, none of this letter writing for you, Slick. And I wasn't allowed to say sorry. Do you know why? Sorry was my middle name. If I hurt you in some way, I'd go, sorry, then you were dismissed. I wouldn't think about it again. You don't want my sorry, that's up to you. But amends are to make right. So when I had to make my amends, I had to say, what in your eyes can I do to make this situation right? That's an amend. Because I learned a long time ago that an amends has nothing to do with my comfort. It, in the long run it does, but in the short run it's about dis- repairing the damage I've done in your life. It's about restoring peace in your life and making amends for the hurt I did to you. It ain't about me. If it's still about you, you've missed the point. It's about showing those people we have harmed that there is a thing called recovery. And that it is active and it is happening and it is real. And it's most important that we don't come up with the bright idea of what they should get. No, they call it. They call it. And you know, it's a hard list to make. I was 25 years sober up in Wisconsin, or down in Wisconsin, I guess I should say. And... uh, I was at my sister's house, and she's terrific. We've had a wonderful relationship. All my family, uh, my three sisters and my one brother who's sober longer than dirt, he, uh, he's wonderful, and uh, we have a wonderful relationship. But we're up there, and we're driving, uh, driving down the road, and I'm just celebrating my 25th birthday. And we're driving down the road, and my sister tar- starts talking about the time that they committed me to the Iowa State Mental Institution. That's when I was termed psychotic, neurotic, insanely violent, hopelessly addicted to drugs and chronic alcoholic. And that's what any 18-year-old wants to hear. Thanks a lot. <laughs> but we started talking about that. And I was in the front seat, and my sister was in the back. And I was, she was on that side, and I was watching her through the rearview mirror. As we were talking about that, tears were just streaming down her face. And I, I said, Stacy, what's wrong? What's wrong? She said, uh, 
I lost my baby brother that day. And she was just 25 years later. And I said, oh, honey, I'm sorry. She said, no, Eddie. She said, no, you just don't get it. You were gone. Mentally, you were gone. My baby brother died that day. And I'd lost him. And I can't shake that from my mind. She went on my list. And I said, what can I do? What can I do to make right? She said, oh, Eddie, you've done more than made it right. God's really touched your life and you're doing some great stuff. What you can do for me is keep doing what you're doing. And I said, I pray someday that that image leaves you. But I never, she didn't even make my list. How many didn't make yours? How many didn't make yours? I'm 28 years old and uh, 8 years sober with the Harlem Globetrotters traveling all over the world meeting kings and queens and presidents. I swing by Davenport, Iowa to see good old mom. Press does a big thing. Hometown boy makes it good. I'm some sort of big deal, I'll tell you. And I walk into the house and I'm staying with mom and I decide to go to a meeting. So I get all dressed and I'm starting to go out the door. And you know what my mother says. Where are you going? <laughs> I'm thinking, wait a minute. I travel all over the world. I manage the Harlem Globetrotters. I am a big boy. I've been out of this house since I was 13. Da, 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 da. That's all going on in here. What I heard my mouth say is, to a meeting, mom. You know what she said next? What time are you going to be home? <laughs> Same thing. <laughs> what I heard my mouth say is, Mom, I'll be home about 10.30. If I'm going to be later, I'll call you. You know what she had the nerve to say? Okay, honey. <laughs> that is the first day in my life I ever allowed my mother to be my mother. I always thought she had the rage in the arguments. All she wanted was some simple questions answered. I was a parent abuser for a long time. When I got here for a number of years, all, you, all I could tell you is how they mistreated me. Well, there's the other side to that coin. <coughs> How'd you treat them? Wouldn't you be proud if your kids could see how you behaved? You know? That's a living amend. And some years later, when my mother called and said, Eddie, I got cancer. And they said, I got a year to live. I said, I'll be right there. Spent the next year with my mom, taking care of my mom. I did something equally impossible. I became a good son. And everything she needed, we did. there was no cross words. Because I gave up arguing that night. I said, if I'm going to be later, I'll call you, Mom. And there were no harsh words. And the day she died, there was no sadness in my heart because I knew where my mom was going. And I knew that she knew how much I loved her. There was no sadness in my house that day. I learned that through steps eight and nine. I learned that through the examples I saw when I'd go to meetings. Real examples, not discussion meetings where they're throwing out every goofy idea on earth but experienced strength and hope that actually worked, that actually were proven. Making amends to those people who've died and gone on. How do you do that? A lot of ways. I'm one of those that believe that we just go into another room. That That's all we do. We just go into another room and there's a whole different deal going on there. Can't wait to see it. I'm like the puppy scratching at the door. That's where my dad's at and that's where I want to go. You know. And... Uh, 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 but I believe their spirits are alive. Most religions that I read believe the same thing, that we are eternal, that we go on. I don't know about reincarnation. I don't ever want to be a toad, but who knows? <laughs> but in that, their spirit if their spirit is all things, then it's not bound by the body anymore, and it can be all places at all times. So everybody I've ever loved and lost is here with me right now, and I dare say with you right now, right here if that's the way you want to look at it. It's up to you. Maybe you want to change your mind. Then I can make those mends at any given moment, at any given time. 
and I know without a shadow of a doubt in my heart and mind that they've been heard and I don't have to carry that anymore I don't have to carry that anymore why not why not you know I remember uh, they asked me to do an invocation at a big city celebration <laughs> and I'm up there and I'm doing the invocation and the mayor's going to speak and right as I put my head down to pray I see a guy I hadn't seen in 32 years that I want amends to I went oh boy yeah there we go did the invocation the mayor talked and as soon as he got done I beat feet over to this guy I said Bill I don't know if you remember me or not he said hi Ed <laughs> oh, <good. laughs> and I said uh, you know uh, 30 some years ago I broke into your house and stole a lot of stuff and I said uh, I have no defense against that and I'm in a, a program that demands that I make right any of those wrongs that I come up with, and I need to know what I can do to make that right. Now, I want to tell you, at that time, I was pastor of that 1,200-member church and had a, had a prominent position in that community. But I didn't think, oh, gee, what if the newspaper gets a hold of this? Who cares? If you want to judge me by your, my past, that's your problem. It isn't mine. I'm free all that crap. And I didn't give it a second thought. And Bill was very gracious and wonderful. He said, Eddie, he said, you know, I've been watching you, especially in the last 10 years since I've been back from California. He said, you help a lot of people. He said, if you really want to make amends to me, you keep doing exactly what you're doing. And I said, well, God bless you. And I know the stuff that had gotten stolen had been returned to him because the guy I broke into the house with, you know, went and squealed on me and returned the stuff. But that's either... That's neither here nor there. I had an amend to make for the wrong I did. It isn't about, oh, it got returned. That's not necessary. I still had to make amends for what I did. And then through this, uh, the eighth, the ninth step, I'll tell you what, my life is an open book anymore. I can talk to you about any area of my life. God, what a freedom. You know, what a freedom. Uh, and I found that here. And I found it through the willingness to get better instead of stay the same, instead of stay, keep, the, keep the same old sickness going. You know, uh, we can keep that same old sickness going and all we're going to remain is sick. And eventually, we grow or we go. I really believe that. We grow or we go. If we don't keep growing, we're going to end up going. And I want to keep going. I want to keep going to the point of uh, uh, whatever's ahead of me. And I know it's good. I had to make amends to God as I misunderstood Him. Because I'd done a lot of harm to a lot of people, especially those church going folks. I liked your houses especially. Usually had a lot of good stuff in them. And I had to make amends to God by making amends to His children. That's where Bill came in, you know. When I had to make amends to him, uh, it's very easy for me to take for granted the gifts I've been given today until I remember what I've been freed from. There was a time when I didn't have a choice about stealing from you, I had to steal from you. There was a time when I didn't mean to lie to you, I just had to lie to you. There was a time when I would tell you something and you could never count on me. You know? And because of the steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, I'm not that kind of person anymore. If I say I'm going to be somewhere, I'm going to be somewhere. Last year was the first time I ever had to cancel a speaking engagement in 35 years because I missed a flight of stairs. When 360 pounds comes down on one leg, the leg goes, uh uh. And I felt horrible about that. But now I rejoice as I only missed one. Could have been a lot more. Who in your life? What about work? How are you doing on men's or have you just gotten sober and it's all their problem? I started 12-step meetings at my work. And it's funny because all of them came in and they all complained about work. Second time that happened, I said, excuse me, I'm chairing this meeting. 
And we are now banning complaints about work. If you don't have a program here at work, I really don't want to hear about it. Well, Mr. Hotty Toddy. Oddly enough, the next week they said, let's do step one about work. (laughs) I've got a guy that everybody was terrified of a year ago. He's, He's this wide. And he's got that shaved head and that Fu Manchu and that bandana. And, you know, everybody's terrified with him. He's a good worker. He's dependable. He's one of us. And we started working the steps. They're actually looking at hiring him for the human resources department. <laughs> a year ago, they just wanted to cage him off somewhere. You know. <laughs> But when we apply these steps in our life, they're effective. It's very important, the example we set, because uh, you don't know who's looking. And there's been several instances. I shared one with uh, Doug, I believe, the other day at breakfast. I didn't share it here, did I? About the restaurant? No, I don't think so. I was in a restaurant and I was talking to one of the guys I sponsor about you need to be re- you need to be a reflection of the twelve steps of Alcoholics Anonymous no matter where you're at. Did I share that with you? And I said, regardless where you're at, what you're doing, you may be the only example of this program anybody ever sees, and this is a way of life that can change lives. So you need to be a good example about it. And we're talking and we're talking. Forty five minutes go by. Honest God, forty five minutes go by. And the waitress comes over and says, I forgot to put in your order. And you know what I said? Thanks for being so honest. How refreshing is that? She kind of looked at me funny. And I said, well, go ahead and put them in now. She said, are you sure? And I said, yeah, that's fine. She sent the manager over to us to make sure I was okay. And they gave us free dessert. Okay, I'll take free dessert. I don't buy free dessert. And we started talking again. We got about halfway through our, our, our meals, and the, the booze were high enough where you couldn't see on the other side. And this guy and his wife came around, and he had tears in his eyes. And he said, are you Ed M that talks in AA? And I said, yeah. He said, you know, you've saved my life. You've changed my life. And he had tears in his eyes. And his wife leaned over and kissed me and said, thank you for helping him so much. And as they left, I thought, what if that waitress would have come and I would have been the old me sober and just opened up on that dummy? And then we continued our conversation of how important it is to be an example of what you believe in this program, no matter what. Last week, I'm going up to Wisconsin to speak, and I'm 110 miles away from home. Uh, going up north, it's not bad, about 260 miles, something like that. I stopped at this convenience store, and this guy had opened his van door right into his eye, eyelid right here, just split her wide open. And he's sitting there, and, and I go up to him, and I said, are you okay? And he said, oh, man, he said, it really hurts. And I said, well, you got it pretty bad. I said, you need to get something on that. So I went in the store, and I bought him some antibiotics and some bandages, and I brought them out to him, made sure they were paid for, took care of him. And I said, are you okay now? And he said, yeah, yeah. And he went into the bathroom, took care of business. And somebody that was riding with him said, aren't you Ed from Davenport? And I went, yeah. He said, you came to the treatment center I was at six months ago. Is that what you meant about being kind to people? And I said, yeah, buddy. Yeah. That's what I meant. It's so important what we do. Please, if you've been given this thing lip service, stop it. You're killing people. Not only you, but others around you. And if you change it around, you can have an effect on people outside of AA like you'd never believe. Like you would never believe. How are we doing on time? Oh, we're we're done. (laughs) (laughs) So that's it about step nine. No, uh... But the thing I I pray for when I come and I do these things, and believe me, it's my honor to do it, is that somehow, and I always feel inadequate about doing it, that somehow I can convey to you how lost I was and how found I am today. 
because of what you've given me. And it's not about me being special. I'm average at best. But this program is very special. I like the ending. Thank you very much. <laughs>